Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Clara Bocchino from the Sustainable Water Partnership and coordinator for the Big Data Analytics and Transboundary Water Collaboration for Southern Africa. Thank you all for joining us for the second uh, seminar in this series, which is being produced by the IBM Research and the Sustainable Water Partnership. Today we have Dr. Bruce Elmgreen, a research scientist in IBM Research based in New York. So thank you for having woken up so early. Um, he has a PhD in astrophysics from Princeton and he is author of over 700 papers. Currently works in a program called PEARS, which he'll talk to, to us about. And he uses weather and other data to study severe storms and long-term changes. Just like we did the last time, I am not um, going to um, unmute the participants. You're all being automatically mute on the beginning of this broadcast because um, we would like to give um, our presenter the chance to give his presentation. Nonetheless, Bruce has agreed that if anybody has any pending questions, you're welcome to ask them as he speaks, maybe by raising your hand or typing the question in the opposite um, section. And um, otherwise, we'll have a session for questions and answers at the end. Um, you can type questions in as you go, and then if they're urgent, maybe just note that they're urgent and I'll and ask it um, immediately. Otherwise, we'll postpone everything until the end. So without much further ado, I'm going to give the word to our presenter, Bruce, um, so that he can take us through the first of two sessions on geospatial data at scale. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, thank you, Clara. Uh, and thank you, the rest of you, for attending this. Um, I'm going to talk about geospatial data, which is very big data, and about a data platform that IBM has put together to help people use this data and make sense of it. So this first lecture, geospatial data at scale, will cover geospatial data in general, and then using PEAR's geoscope, and I'll show examples with a graphical user interface. And in particular, we'll look up close at some droughts and storms that have happened in Africa over the last decade or so. And then in the second lecture next week, I'll show you how to program and to use um, functions to retrieve all kinds of data and do analysis with that. PEARS stands for Physical Analytics Integrated Data Repository and Services. It's a project that started here at Yorktown four or five years ago to integrate data and make it useful in a highly parallel platform. So you know about geospatial imaging. There's, of course, um, satellite imagery of all kinds, but also geospatial temporal concerns weather, which has uh, a time series, it may have many different atmospheric levels, different pressure levels. It may have uh, temperature, humidity, rainfall, snowfall, uh, wave height, and so on. Land use may be government data, which identifies acreage planted in corn or soy or other types of crops. It may be farmer identified crops, maybe satellite images using vegetation indices to find um, uh, where crops are growing or where forests are. Of course, there's infrastructure, which is city data or street data, um, all different types of data with various different um, attributes. So for example, in the case of satellite images, because of the limited downlink speeds of data from satellites, you, you tend to have a choice. There are some satellites that cover large areas at low resolution and can do it fairly quickly, like the NASA satellite GOES, which is geostationary. It just hovers above one point of the Earth, and every half hour or so, it sends down an image of a whole hemisphere or, or a blow up of a hemisphere at one to four kilometer resolution. At the other extreme, there's the European Sentinel satellites. It has two of them, uh, satellites 2A and B, with a resolution of only 10 meters at short wavelength. But it may take five days to visit a single place twice. 
And if it's cloud covered, on the time it visits, it may uh, compile data from 10 days to pick the best pixel without cloud cover. So there is this choice. High resolution satellite data tends to come infrequently. Low resolution satellite data tends to be more frequent. Weather data is usually simulation data, and it's as frequent as they can make it, uh, depending on the size of the data. Weather data is enormous. Not only the different types of data, but it's three-dimensional. It's in time. Typically, it's useful to have weather data uh, posted every hour. Uh, it can extrapolate uh, days into the future or hours into the future. It's uh, typically a uh, warehoused for archival data, for past studies of storms. So uh, the ECMWF, that's the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, produces several hundred terabytes of data per day. Now you know that you can search the web for many billions of web pages within seconds. That kind of searching is fairly easy. There may be keyword searchings. You can search for very structured data, typically words. Similarly, for business transaction, these might be files on some kind of uh, computer that a bank may have or a business. Again, searching for words or numbers or, or, uh, or header files, metadata, that can go quickly. Social media data also based on words, based on uh, image recognition turned into words, that can be rapidly searched. But geospatial tends to be images. How do you search for a particular thing in an image? There may be header data, metadata, which tells you the place and time of the image, but not necessarily what's in the image. So it's often very hard to search. It often comes in separate files because they're images. Maybe they're street images from a, a camera. Maybe they're satellite images. File management is very difficult, especially for extremely large amounts of data. So Paris Geoscope contains nearly five petabytes of data. And the key point here is that it's curated. That is, it's put in a standard format. It's received and put in this format once, and then everyone can use it many times, all relying on that same format. It has thousands of data layers, and a layer might be, say, temperature or pressure or elevation or wave height, all as a function of time, typically. It has the option that users can upload their own data and curate it similar to the way that the uh, system already has data. And it also contains analytic capabilities of various types, as you'll see. So for example, you can answer the question stated here, show me agricultural areas. So now that may involve data that's a crop surveys. It may involve a vegetation indices. Where the amount of rain, okay, so now that's weather data. Rain typically comes every hour. I want the rain in the last month. So now I have to integrate over the last month. Was 80%? Oh, no, that involves a, a logical operation. Below historical averages. And now that involves integrating for the last month or the last 10 years, or maybe integrate for all of the Januaries in the last 10 years. So I want to know relative to January. Now you see there are various kinds of data involved in a question like this, and there's logic, logical operations to exclude certain data. And we don't wanna just call up thousands and thousands of files and do the integration separately every time. We like to have all that data stored so it's at our fingertips and I can do operations on the data where it's stored without actually moving the data. So we need logic, we need arithmetic, we need easy retrieval at the data, which means in the node where the relevant data is stored. Pairs contains many kinds of data, it contains, as I mentioned, satellite images of various types, it contains climate or weather, weather forecasts, 
There's wildfire data or data on active fires, land use, cropscape, for example, the types of crops planted, that's usually a government provided data set, soil properties, elevation. Some of these change very rapidly, hourly, every 10 minutes for some. Some doesn't change much at all, like elevation or soil properties. Now, each of these data types comes from a data service like uh, NASA or ESA or a weather service. And so it has the data on its own archives. You can go there and get the data yourself. So why do you want to put it all together? Well, this turns out to be very important, especially for big data, because data usefulness increases when it can be combined with other data. As you saw for that query, I'd like crop data or vegetation data. I'd like weather data. I'd like to do things with that data, like integrate it. I may want to combine that with maps of cities. I may want to combine that with income levels or sens sensor data. It's useful when it's combined with other data. Also, big data, especially geospatial temporal data, which is big data, it's too big to move. At a typical disk drive read speed of 100 or 700 megabits per second, it takes a day to read a terabyte worth of data from that disk. So you can't take terabytes from data archives, bring them to your computer, and do interesting interrogations on a minute or hourly basis. It's on a days to weeks basis. So it's too big to move. You have to go to where the data is. And also, this means these two things, that big data attracts other big data. It's useful to be combined, and it can't be moved. So big data has a kind of gravity. Systems with big data, useful to other people, just grow in the data size. So this is an overview of the architecture of Pear's Geoscope. It's highly scalable. It has a no SQL design. That means it's not files. You don't get at it with a structured query language. And once you get away from files, you can suddenly scale to hundreds of petabytes. It already has some five petabytes of industry relevant data. It ingests and curates automatically some 200 terabytes a day. It has spatial parallelism. That means different regions on the earth are stored in different nodes of a computer. So as I broaden my region from a small map to a big map, it doesn't take any longer. It just goes to different nodes. So this makes for high speed retrieval. And the time dimension is stored on the same node. So it's also very fast in time and users can get their own data in. So on the left here, you see at the top, I don't know if you can resolve that, I'll read what's in some, some of those ellipses. Um, you can get sensor data or satellite data, transfer from the cloud, you can get simulation data such as weather, social data, and so on. So the various data sources, which can all be set up to download automatically, or you can automatically load anything of your own choice, or you can load one-off examples of data of your own choice. And the data is curated. The automatic downloads go through a scheduler. The curation involves assigning a key to every data value. A key consists of a spatial and a time stamp turned into bits. Then it's put this on a grid. You'll see in a minute what this grid is. It's a universal grid on the entire longitude latitude system for the whole Earth. It takes away the metadata, which could be the satellite name. It could be the time, the, the solar angle. It could, could be um, the, the uh, uh, Dr. Santos wait, I'm sure I was sitting there and wait, he was saying, wait. I could give you a gram of this and I could get a gram of that. And I was like, did I just stumble into a drug deal? I hear someone um, speaking. He was talking about uh, very Sorry specific. about that. It seems as um, he has logged uh, in as a I, as a, um, a, a, a Yes, they've just 
muted themselves. Thank you. Let's see. You can carry. Okay, so I'll keep going. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I was just talking about metadata. It has to take that and put that somewhere else. So if you look in the middle box, the metadata goes into a relational database where it's easily retrieved in the usual way. But the data itself, the, the large volume in this key value storage is put into a, a HBase type database, which is part of Hadoop. And also part of that, you can get a Spark data flame and, and do analytics there on the data. You can access this. Now, if I go in the bottom, users are all those little ellipses on the bottom. They can access this through a open application programming interface or software development kits, plugins. It can use Python inside Dockers with PyTorch, Jupyter Notebooks, all kinds of familiar user interfaces, which then access the data inside the data store. So it has data coming in from one side, the user coming in from the other. The data is handled automatically to put on this grid. The user has familiar tools which launch jobs, which actually touch the data where the data is. So a little bit more on the architecture. The data are stored in a hierarchical coordinate grid. So hierarchical means the smallest pixel is a millionth of a degree. And then it goes up by factors of two until it reaches about eight degrees. So there are 20 some levels of factors of two. The spatial grid is organized in this Z order, and you can see a little picture of that in a quad tree. Z order means that neighboring pixels in this factor of two, power of two, or, uh, or power of four in area, a grid, are next to each other in storage. Those numbers there are actual bit values. And the uh, most significant figures of bits correspond to the largest areas and the least significant figures, which, uh, which change the most often, correspond to the highest resolution, smallest areas. So the bit, which is a long sequence of bits, um, in the spatial key corresponds to a location. And for similar numbers in that bit string, you have similar locations. And this makes spatial archiving very easy so that neighboring regions in space are stored together in the computer. And that's how they can be fetched easily. Or if you go to a very different region, it's on a different node. Also, time is part of that bit string, where uh, a number of bits uh, designates time to the nearest second, starting from 1970 and going plus or minus many decades. Time sequences at the same position are quickly retrieved because they're located together in storage. So for example, 14,000 timestamps, which is uh, hourly data for about a year and a half, for two different quantities, maybe temperature and humidity at the same position can be retrieved in about one second. So examples in industry, for, in, for example, in the utilities industry with energy, you may ask where and when, and this is always the question, where and when, so here's your spatial and temporal data, where and when to trim vegetation to avoid storm outages. So that may involve a vegetation map, a weather map, civic infrastructure to tell you where um, power lines are, different kinds of data, agribusiness, where and when to buy or sell commodities. So there again, you may have a crop map or a vegetation map. You may have a weather map to tell if there's a drought or heavy rains. You may have civic infrastructure showing roads and distances to nearby uh, warehouses. Insurance, where and when are the risks. There may be elevation to show you where flooding could happen, civic infrastructure to tell you where houses are, weather maps to tell you uh, flooding histories, government, where and when to respond to a natural disaster. That could again be a uh, elevation map for flooding. It can be uh, um, humidity or rainfall to tell you where crops are dry 
So there might be a fire disaster to predict uh, probabilities for fire disasters. And civic infrastructure to show your roads, to give you access, to show your houses, to tell you who's living there so the government can respond properly. All of these you see are combined data sets, which are useful for businesses or government to do their function. And the architecture of pairs allows flexibility for use with several key attributes. It's cloud-based, so it can be accessed by anyone from anywhere. It's parallel in data and compute for wide dynamic scaling. As I mentioned, the data organization allows efficient time sampling. So that means you can do change detection easily. You can detect where vegetation has changed or where civic structure has changed to look for flooding or fires or drought. The data pre-processing actually stores the curated data. Uh, so it can be used by many individuals with few user commands using familiar tubes or uh, tools and an intuitive interface. So now let's visualize some data. So I read that there was a water crisis in Cape Town. My friends living there experienced this. This was very severe. It made the New York Times. People were watching this. And if I look at the reservoir water storage, you can see starting in around 2015, it got less and less and less. It got really severe by 2019. So how can we see this in Paris Geoscope? So if we go to Paris Geoscope, let's get started. This is the uh, central page. If I push get started, I have a login window, so I'll log in. And then the first thing I might see is a, a window like this showing examples. If I click on this, I can go to these individual examples, but I'm not going to do that. The next little link shows me queries, and you'll see some of this more. I can query uh, particular regions, asking for, say, temperature or weather uh, precipitation in a particular region. Well, I'll come back to this later. I can go to Data Explorer and query particular kinds of data. So now I'm interested in that drought in Cape Town. So I'm going to type in here the word precipitation, press search. It'll take me to the kinds of data that have precipitation information. So you see below that 10-day weather forecast, daily US weather, global weather, ECMWF, many different kinds of data. I'm going to go to global weather ERA5. And I'm going to click on that data layers, which will take me inside. And once inside, I can search under precipitation. And I see this particular data layer. It's got an ID number, which is how Pairs keeps track of it. It explains a little bit what it is. It gives you a link so you can look up more of that data. It has a spatial resolution of 12. That's the 12th layer inside the hierarchy, 0.13 degrees. Um, that corresponds to about uh, 30 uh, kilometers. It tells you that it's four byte data. It gives you a one hourly intervals. It tells you the reach around the world, which in this case, uh, is the whole earth. So I want to view this in geoscope. So I'm going to click on that link. And it shows me the whole earth for this particular data. And initially it says no data because my cursor is pointed at some random place in the ocean. It doesn't have anything there. So I'm going to look on the right and I see that plus or minus. I want to zoom in. And here now I've zoomed into Africa, South Africa. There's Cape Town. And I put my little dot near Cape Town, and it shows me the data that's for total precipitation for Cape Town from this particular weather service, Global Weather ERA-5. ERA is a reanalysis. And I see that I have some data going back to uh, 1980, but it's sparse. Geoscope hasn't downloaded all of that because no one has a particular interest. But starting at around 2008, it has every hour of every day. So I'm going to reset my beginning time to uh, something very recent, 2013, because I'm interested in this drought, which started around 2015. So here's hourly data of precipitation at the point indicated by this little dot near Cape Town. And it shows the region I'm interested in. 
the time when the reservoirs got so depleted. Well, that's Cape Town. I know the reservoirs come from water all around that, so I want to push on that dot in another region. I'll try up here. Similar data, similar precipitation. And I look at this and I say, where's the drought? I don't see it. It's still raining a little bit every day. If I compare to earlier times, well, maybe the rain is a little more dense. Maybe the peaks are a little higher. Maybe it rains more days, but I still see rain. And it's hard to see the drought in looking at this data. So I think, okay, well, I can download this as a comma separated value file, all of this data. And then I can chug away on it and look for that drought. This is what I get. I get a value every hour measured in meters per hour of precipitation. So I'll read on the left column, maybe you can't read it, 49459, that's the data layer. It gives the date, 2016, 04, 22, that's April 22nd. It gives the time, 090000, that's nine hours, UTC. And it gives a value, 0 0.00003505, that's meters per hour at this location. Well, it's gonna be hard to see the drought this way too, because for these number of years, this is 12 years, I got 100,000 data values of an hour each one. At 15 kilometer pixels, the resolution's 30, as I said, but pairs of samples that are 15 kilometers, I have four and a half billion values. It's gonna be hard to see the drought this way. I'd like to average this all together, see the drought better. But pairs can do this. For each pixel in the map of South Africa, I want to average together all the precipitation values for each year, for 12 years. And I want to find the 12 year average and the RMS for year to year variations. All of this can be done without moving the data. Then for each pixel, I want to difference the yearly average from the 12 year average and divide by the 12 year RMS. And this gives me the standard precipitation index for each year. And I want to just export that map to see if a particular region is high compared to the average or low compared to the average. So I've started with about four and a half billion values and I'm going to reduce that to 12 maps which is about a half a million values. That's a data reduction factor. By the time I actually have to remove any data, it's a reduction factor of 10 to the minus four. So the standard precipitation index is a common index. It just takes the uh, temporal value minus the average divided by the standard deviation. And here I'm gonna use the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts the uh, reanalysis number five, which gives me hourly data at 30 kilometer resolution. Now here's a 12 year average made into a map. On the left is the average. And I could see that in the Eastern part of South Africa, there's a lot of rain. In the Western part, there's this little red spot. Well, that's the Karoo Desert, you know of that. Not much rain there. Cape Town, on the lower left has lots of rain. So what's the problem there? I see the variance, not much variance in the desert area. It's always dry. A reasonable amount of variance on the east. So it rains, it doesn't rain. Year to year, it has some variance. Cape Town has some variance too. So I'm starting to think that's in the lower left. So I think, oh, maybe this is some kind of a quirky variation that they've had to give them the drought. Now let's look at this year to year. So now you see the map for every year of the FPI. So that's the yearly precipitation minus that 12 year average divided by the standard deviation. Up on the left, 2008, then it goes in sequence, 2009, 10, 11. And you could see variations. I'm looking at Cape Town, that's the lower left again, and it's blue at, in 2008, so it had a lot of nice rain. 2009, it's some kind of mixture of blue and red. 2010, a little bit of drought, but a couple of years later that recovered, so the reservoirs are fine. But now if I look in the bottom row, 
2016, even starting 2015, which is on the right of the middle row, it's pretty red in the Cape Town area. 2016, it's red. 2017, it's really deep red. Now this is three years of no rain or very little rain, substandard rain. 2018, may have had a, a little burst there, but it's still red in the lower corner. 2019 was terrible. We can see that drought very clearly. Nowhere else in Africa is there this drought, but it's in that um, southwest corner and quite severe. I can do the same thing oh, that zeroes in on that. Uh, that drought, very easy to see. I can do the same thing for soil moisture, which is a different layer in the same um, ECM WF uh, ERA5 series. And I've made the uh, soil moisture index the same way, subtracting the 12 year average from the yearly value. And again, you can see that red, the soil also is very dry in the um, southwest part of South Africa. So now I notice in the in the news this a very severe storm, 2017, June 7th. Wind speeds as high as 120 kilometers per hour, wave heights of nine to 12 meters. Caused death, damaged schools, flooding of homes. Can I see that storm? And in the next lecture, I'll zoom in on maps of the wind speed and show you how to do that, and the uh, and the wave heights. But right now, I just want to see the rain. So I go back to that same uh, web page I had before, and I click on one of the time series, and it shows me a map in color scale of the rain at that time. This is for June 7th, and a little uh, square um, on the left shows me 2017, 06, 07, June 7th at 6 in the morning. And that's a little map in blue of the precipitation rate. And then the lower left corner are the units in meters per hour. There's a blow up hourly. So that's the storm. I read some other news. Let's go up to Kenya. Lush land dries up, withering Kenya's hopes. This is September 2009, a devastating drought. Let's see if we can find that. So I put my little cursor at Kenya. I center it the time from 2008 to today. And I see the rainfall. It's the same total precipitation, global ERA5. And I've put the gray scale or the color scale as sort of half level so I can see the countries underneath it. And now I can see that drought directly. In 2009, there was hardly any rain during the um, summer season. This shows the soil moisture, same thing. There's a huge deficit of soil moisture followed by some rain. But that deficit is lower than anywhere else you see since then. And in the color map, uh, that has units of meters cubed per cubic meter. That's the amount of, of that's sort of the fraction of the volume of the soil that's water. And in this case, it's from zero to seven centimeters. So it's the top surface. There's a lot of very red areas there, meaning that soil is bone dry at this time. But 2018, the same area had terrible floods, beginning in March. So this says that an ongoing natural disaster in Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, Rwanda, Somalia, and so on, East Africa, affecting millions of people. Excess rains began falling in March 2018 following a year of severe drought and are still ongoing as of June, 2018. Overflow of dams, nearly 500 people have lost their lives. Let's look for that. Same precipitation and it's the same scan where you saw the Kenya drought on the left, but now I'm looking at the time 
of this um, heavy rain. And I could see some kind of drought in the low area, 2017, what they're talking about. And I put my cursor in May of 2018, where it's starting to rain. And I could look at the rainstorms of that particular day, May 2nd, 2018. And I can understand why they're having a pretty severe rain because it's followed nearly a year of low level rain, not as low as 2009, but still pretty low. Here's the soil moisture. It was low for that year, not as low as 2009 again, but still pretty low. There's a significant valley there with a sudden burst of high moisture in May. And that uh, high moisture saturated soil is shown in blue at the top. Similarly, last year, just a few months ago, November, flooding in East Africa affects more than a million people, higher than normal rainfall. So that's in that same map, and that actually that little peak there, that little white dot, which shows some of the rainfall in November 21st, 2019. Similarly for soil moisture. Okay, so the SPI, the precipitation index in Kenya, shows that 2009 drought very clearly. Look how dark that is all throughout the uh, western part of Kenya. It still has some rain on the east, but very dark red there. And it's kind of unprecedented. Nowhere else do you see that kind of a drought. By the time you get to 2017, in the lower part, second from the left, you see that drought appearing again. But then 2018 and 19, it turns very blue. And that was a 2018 flood and the 2019 flood. You can see all of this laid out to you very clearly, integrating um, many gigabytes of data into maps that can be easily visualized. And here's the average and the variance for precipitation in Kenya. The average rainfall is fairly high in the eastern part. That's where that a drought became pretty severe. And the soil moisture in Kenya. Again, you could see the drought in the upper part and the very saturated soil on the lower right. So you've seen that Pears Geoscope is a repository an analytics platform for geospatial temporal data designed to minimize data movement. Raw data, such as crops, weather, elevation, civil, are automatically downloaded and curated on a regular hierarchically structured grid with a range of two to 23 in spatial scales and timed in the nearest second. So that's from about a 10th of a meter spatial scale to eight kilometers. Data are stored by key and value in a Z order quad tree with space and time encoded in a 128 bit key. Using open source tools, HBase on Hadoop for extreme parallelism, which means that different spatial regions are on different processors, different nodes, and time is on the same node. There's three times redundancy. There's also a deep backup in a tape form and autonomous management provided by the Hadoop system. Data are readily accessed by this graphical user interface, which I just showed you, and other methods, Python, R-based APIs, which I'll show you next time, can be run from the cloud using an open source application wrapper. Okay, so that's the end, let's do a live demo. I'm thinking to myself, I want a vacation in Africa somewhere to celebrate the first day of my New York summer, June 21st. But I hear that Africa is pretty hot. So I don't want to just go anywhere. I want to go to a nice place where it's nice and temperate and it's not too hot.
So I'm going to make a query in Pairs Geoscope. So I'm going to get out of this. I'm going to go to Pairs Geoscope. We have seen I made some previous queries. And I'm going to create a query. So I want to select the layer. Now I have some choices. What category? Analytical, client, satellite, survey, weather. And inside weather, I have more choices. Weather forecast, 10-day weather forecast, 16-day uh, weather forecast, 48-day atmospheric weather, daily US weather, daily global, North America, global climate, ERA 5 derived. That's a good one. I go there. Now I also have more choices. Maximum temperature. That sounds pretty good. I want to know it's not too hot for me. So I'll click on that one. And then I'll add that to my search. Maximum temperature, good. Now I could add other layers. Humidity, rain. But I just want to do temperature right now. And where do I want to go? Well, I'm going to go to Africa. So I can type in Africa. It's already got a polygon for Africa. Next. So it's going to give me today, but I want to go to first day of summer. So I have to go back last year to June. Twenty first. Just get that day when I'm going to visit this year. Okay, June twenty first. Next, maximum temperature. I don't want it aggravate that I'll just take it like it is and I'm going to type what this is my vacation now I'm going to submit a query run it Okay, so it's launching it on the left. It tells me the progress. And this might take 30 seconds to get all of Africa together and the temperature for a particular day. Other queries I've run, you can see a wave height. Uh, the one on the right is a, a storm on that day. What happened here? Oh, June 20th. It, let me go back. Let's do that again. Hmm. What happened? I had, it looks like it kicked out of the date because it gave me June 20th. Sure. Area five. Let's go to what? Uh, 
in temperature. I wonder what happened. Oh, I, I'm pushing the wrong button. Okay, I got that. Got that. Got that. My little cursor here is giving me trouble. Let's go to, I want to pick, uh, there we go. Now this was the trouble I had before. Let's, let's go to 2019. Okay, so now that's right. I got the right date. Some temperature. I must have. Uh, that's got the right date. Let's try that again. Get rid of that one. Uh, now I see, oh, look at the date. It's changed that date. Oh no, that might be today. Okay, let's see what happens. There we go. 95%. There we go. That took about 30 seconds. I don't know what went wrong before. So I'm going to click on that. Okay. So now here is a color map showing temperature in the blue regions. 272 Kelvin, so that's about freezing. So I see down here in uh, Johannesburg area, it's somewhat cold, may not want to go there. The red area is 312, that's 39 degrees centigrade, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, I don't want to go there. Somewhere right in the middle is nice. So let's see where that is. I can look at the satellite image with a slider go in and out of that temperature. And I want to find out what country that is, where it's nice and green, nice temperature, Botswana. Aha. So I want to go to Botswana. So now let's let's zoom in and see what's there. Let's go back to the satellite image. That's pretty interesting. Now I look up that, it's a salt plain. You probably know about this. It's got a name for it, which I'm going to have trouble pronouncing, Magda Degati salt plains. And I read about that, and it turns out that's where Homo sapiens first came about 200,000 years ago. So I'm thinking, oh, that would be really fascinating to visit. 
and it's also a nice climate. So there I will plan my vacation. So uh, aside from that glitch, and I don't know what happened a minute ago, uh, that gives you an example of how to use this uh, the GUI. Um, so maybe I can take a break now and ask if there are any questions. Bruce, thank you so much. I, I'm still in awe about this and, and, and how simple it looks, but you know, at the back of my mind, I'm thinking how big of an infrastructure is there to support such a variety of information. And this is just about climate and the impact that it has on on soil. And, and uh, uh, I'm seriously, uh, thank you so much for showing it to us. This is going to become my husband's favorite um, tool for planning exactly that, travel and vacation. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I don't I don't see any questions as yet from the from the attendees. So unless the, ah, um, Kirsten, she's I think it's very it's a technical question. Kirsty is an intern, um, for the big data analytics and transboundary water, um, collaboration. She's currently based at IBM in Johannesburg, and uh, she's saying she's logged into. The Paris Geoscope with her IBM login details, but she's unable to find the ERA 5 layer. Um, and she says it seems that there are less layers there than there are in this presentation. So maybe you should liaise with Kirsty directly to resolve that. I'll, uh, would that would that, does that make sense? Uh, yes, we should do that. Um, maybe you get the interim. You may get others. I, I don't know what you have access to, um, but yes, let's talk about that. Yeah, I think you can talk to, because she's at IBM currently. And then Bediza is uh, one of the other interns um, from the University of Botswana, currently at IBM in Johannesburg, and he has a question. So I'm going to let him, I'm going to unmute you, Bediza, so you can ask your question directly to um, to Bruce. Just a second. Here you go, All right. Hi. Are you able to hear me? Yes. yes. All right. Thank you so much, Bruce, for your presentation. I I liked it. So I just want to find out what's the way to ingest data from an external endpoint into pairs. Yes, well. Um, you would you would want to communicate with others in the pairs group about that. It would have to be um, set up with the user account to, uh, to load up your own data. Um, you could do that, but I I don't actually know the procedure. Um, it, what comes in here in terms of um, files is converted pixel by pixel into this uh, gridded um, a coordinate system. So you could do the same. But, in but the procedure for using your own data, um, I know people here put their own data on. The procedure for that, uh, the details for that, I can't tell you. But, but of course, this is a group of some dozen people and others who are doing that, I could put you in contact with that. So if you find my email and send me your information i could answer that separately all right thank you all right thank you very much Badiza. i'm going to mute you again um there was another question from mohabed um about um the, the improvement of the data resolution i i mean i don't know it seemed pretty good as far as the resolution goes uh, but maybe uh, mohammed you can Tell us which kind of data resolution you found you found um, needs improvement. Um, you can communicate with me uh, by responding to my comment, and then we'll take it for, further with Bruce. And then um, there is a question from Evan Nielsen Peters. He asks, "What if he wants to use that data for a specific end? Can I download part of it?" Um, acquire derivative data or create specific models? 
Bruce. Okay, so I can answer that. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Regarding so some of this data, uh, is is still proprietary for the sources, some weather data and so on, and you could use it in pairs, but you would have to go to the original source to get the data, the full data yourself. But but you can use it, and and as you've seen, the various things you can do with it, and you can um, download uh, CSV files of data from pairs. Other pairs is, has different access rules, so it depends exactly on the data you want. Um, what pairs offers is a value added, the curation service, and and also analytics platform for um, for data that is essentially owned by organizations, NASA, ESA, weather stations, and so on. If it's public, then you may get access to the raw data. If it's not, uh, those organizations prefer you to go directly to them so they know who's using it. So it depends. Um, but you can, certainly, you can certainly do analysis on data yourself, depending on the rights. Evan Newton, does that answer the, your question? I have unmuted you. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I don't know if you can hear me clearly. Yes. Oh, great. Yes, uh, that was exactly what I wanted to know. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think it was uh, pretty uh, clear to uh, concerning what I wanted to know. And um, by the way, uh, as you said, I remember during your presentation, you said that there will be a uh, metadata processing along the way the, uh, that IBM Paris works. So that means that even when I am visualizing in on pairs, uh, I can actually access to that metadata, that metadata somehow, so that, that I can go and pick it up in the source. Uh, yeah, you should be able to. Um, I showed early on that there's a, mm -hmm. let's see, uh, in this overview, that yes. there is a, a regular, yeah, a regular database mm -hmm. uh, where you can access the metadata with uh, SQL type. Um, Okay. Procedure. So yeah, you should be able to find the source information. Okay, great. That is um, all I need. Thank you very much. It was very uh, clear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan Um Just before we close this session of questions, um, I don't see any follow-on from Mohabed. Mohabed Bayeja. Do I pronounce that correctly, sir? Um, I'm just going to quickly unmute you and see if there was any further. Um, oh, it doesn't seem like you have a microphone. Okay, so please communicate with me on chat if you have any follow up questions on the resolution. Um, oh, there you go. Please send them Okay, so rainfall data, for example, he writes in some cases the area of interest is too small and 15 times 15 meters resolution is too big. Thank you. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Bruce. Yeah, if it's a rainfall or weather data, typically the high resolution weather data that uh, is put out by ECMWF, this ERA5 that I showed is 0.25 uh, degrees, uh, some 30 kilometers. If you have a small area, you're right, it's just a few uh, pixels. Um, typically, I mean, it's essentially their mission to give weather forecasts for large regions like what you see on the uh, on the news. Um, to go to very high resolution, uh, there are other organizations that can do that for you, block by block weather resolution. I know IBM has a a service, uh, Deep Thunder computer a program, which has been doing that for a long time. There are others, but uh, but what what Paris has on is is more global, and storms in that sense uh, are are really regional. 
Okay, thank you very much. And then we have one last final question from Zahid, who is also an intern at the IBM um, Research Africa office in Johannesburg under our collaboration. Zahid, I'm going to unmute you now so you can ask your question. Thank you. Here you go. Hi, Zahid. Okay. Hello, hello, Kuna, and hello, Bruce. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. Can you hear me well? No. <laughs> yes. Yes, okay. Now, yeah, go ahead. It okay, had an cool. echo, but go ahead. Um, uh, so some of these uh, 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 GIS products that, that are, uh, or the satellite products that are on pairs, I know that uh, uh, the, some of the native resolutions for these products are not what you have in pairs. So do you guys uh, 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 then resample all these products so that they're uniform across all your data sets, uh, spatially and temporally? Or is it some type of downscaling that you do um, to define these resolutions or upscaling for that matter? Yes. A good question. They are all resampled. Okay. Yeah, they're all resampled um, by interpolation essentially and put on a grid that's smaller than the native resolution to preserve as well as possible the pixel scale of the native resolution. So an individual pixel, you know, has no particular orientation. You just extract from, say, an image uh, the data value in in a, each each local native resolution pixel, and place that or an interpolation of neighbors of that on the on an exact grid. It's always on the same grid, the same coordinates, and you you choose a sampling that is essentially Nyquist frequency. It's lower than the native resolution to preserve the data as much as possible. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, it makes sense. Um, it's a really good as well. Thank you very much for all the questions. Bruce, uh, can I give you um, time again to continue your presentation? Is there some, was that something else that you had time for today? Or are we going to say goodbye and um, give everybody the appointment for next week? Okay, Clara? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, are you suggesting we uh, continue next week? Or, well, I mean, or do you want to go further today? We have another session next week with you. So I don't know if you have completed what you have prepared for today or not. If yes, I have. Oh, okay. So that's, that's what I was asking. <laughs> Okay. So Good. We... So shall we meet same time next week? Yes, I think so. Same time next week. So that will so we'll have some time to digest all of this and maybe play around um with the with the pairs system, the geoscope, and um and then by the time we work with you next week we'll have a, a better than clear understanding. Um I must say, just before I, I close this that it seems that not only me but other people who are clearly more technically um, savvy than I have found this presentation really wonderful and inspiring. So thank you very much, Bruce, for your time today, um, especially at such early hours in the morning, and uh, and for your time again next week. Um, thank you to everybody who has attended, and uh, um, I look forward to see you again to see you all again next week. Um, and have. Very good. Thank you, Clara. Thank you, Clara, and everyone else, too. Thank you. Have a great day.